Quickly, more one question that I was suggested to ask to each of my panelists, and then uh, you know uh, allow our guests um, to to speak to you directly. So I'm going to start with you, Anisha. I think that it's uh, it's a slightly unfair. I want to actually ask you two questions. One is the one that I had in mind, mm -hmm. uh, and I think it's slightly unfair to ask you this because it has a whiff of gender bias. So please forgive me. Uh, but would you be able to talk about? What are the challenges that women entrepreneurs would face? You know, India internationally has an extraordinarily awful reputation for the way that women are treated, a lot of it which is deserved. Um, I want to try and ask you, you know, as, as a woman uh, entrepreneur, um, what, are, what are some of the challenges you've faced and how have you overcome them? Uh, what a loaded question. Um, so, so uh, globally, right, we're all talking about this, and we did a panel about it yesterday. Um, women entrepreneurs in general, if you look at the st statistics, the, the stats on um, just the funding part of it mm. have been dismal. Mm. Uh, if you look at the Indian market, there's about, uh, you know, now we're seeing about 10% of women entrepreneurs in the dot-com space. I think there's about three of us that have funding of 20 million or more. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you look at the statistics, they're really, really low for women entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't think it's more of a challenge in terms of, um, you know, I, I think it's a mindset challenge more than anything else. And I don't think, I think it's an external and internal one that an, especially an Indian woman entrepreneur faces. Uh, the mindset obviously needs to change and we're seeing that happen, uh, you know, quite a bit. Uh, Raj, uh, you know, we talked about this where, uh, you know, he talked about how everybody's drinking wine now. So mm -hmm. that mindset's already changing. People are more accepting. Um, we're seeing more and more women entrepreneurs come into it. Mm -hmm. I mentor a lot of women entrepreneurs. I see it's also an internal mindset. Women entrepreneurs tend to overthink everything, mm. doubt themselves more. Especially in India, we mm -hmm. take on the guilt of our family, uh, you know, our extended family. You want to think what your uncle and aunts are going to... So it's really a two-pronged yeah. thing. It's not uh, just that the Indian mindset per se is... Mm -hmm. uh, at the end of the day, an investor is an investor. They of care course. about the money. That's of it. Course. As simple as that. You know, they, can, they really don't care whether you're a man or a woman. Sure. And it comes to that. Yeah. However, there are a couple of challenges that... You know, it's both mindsets. And I think that's globally. I mean, I talk to women entrepreneurs across the globe now, and it's pretty much there sure. all across. The stats are changing drastically, like just like anything in India more so. Thank you. Patrick, you know, you've helped set up, or are in the process of helping to set up IKEA in India. And, you know, I could make this very glib and talk to you about your experience of how wonderful it has been and how friendly the people are and all of that bullshit rhetoric, which um, I don't have too much time for. Uh, so I, what I would actually ask you is if you can go past that political correctness and, uh, talk, you know, if you can be honest about the really profoundly annoying things um, about setting up a business in India. And really, you know, I mean, just... <coughs> Just let loose. How much time? Let loose, Patrick. <laughs> no, I, uh, yeah. <laughs> Two sides to the question, maybe. Sure. Uh, one uh, is that IKEA, I think, talk a little bit about the supply side and a little bit about the retail side. I know you're probably more about the retail side, but the supply side is that we are looking for uh, large scale operations in India. We want to have partners that are quite big. But the home furnishing market is extremely fragmented, so there are very few players today who actually have the scale. And if we want to become affordable to this many people, we need to have a lot of local production. So we need to find partners that can work with us. And that's a big challenge, actually, to find entrepreneurs who are ready to go into this. Maybe many times it's someone who's doing a car chair or a car seat that is more suitable to do a sofa for us than someone who is making three sofas a year home in their local carpentry. So that's one bit, sustainable source materials. Mm. We really want to grow the sourcing, but there's not so much availability. Cotton, we have done a lot of work in, but now we're looking into wood, we're mm. looking into bamboo, we're looking into water hyacinth, uh, coconut fibers, all these fibers that we can get hold of, but it's not so much organized. Mm. So that we want, we'd be super happy if the politicians could get their um, thought together. process yeah. together, not act, yeah. sounds hard, but thought, thought <laughs> process together, and make some policies there to see how we can push sustainably grown material. Mm. Around the store openings, um, well, it's to facilitate the whole process of actually opening. Are, are we allowed to uh, 
We can start with the labeling. How is an Indian label? Very difficult to comply with. All the, the biggest question, if you ask a foreign retailer, is mm. uh, how do we put the label on the products? What information needs to be there? Mm. And it's the diff most difficult thing to comply with. So if that could be worked up, mm. how an Indian label looks. We're looking at, okay, we weren't allowed to sell on e-commerce when we arrived. As a foreign investor, you were not allowed to sell on e-commerce. We worked with the government for a time, and they changed the rule. Okay. <laughs> That's good. Uh, uh, yeah, these are <laughs> very nice. So and they might change it back. You know how they are. Yeah, it could be. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it depends on the day. <laughs> uh, we worked with them on the sourcing norms. They changed. Uh, we're looking into labor things. You mm -hmm. know, we, we, we're an equality-driven company. We want to hire 50% women. Wow. In, in retail today, well you're not allowed to have women working after 8 in the evening. Mm. Yep, slowly it's changing. Yeah. There's a new retail policy that we worked with. Our yeah, yeah. master has changed. That's the first one under Pradesh has changed. But there's something we need to work on. We're not allowed to do logistics in the night because uh, there's, you're not allowed to operate at night. Mm. And we have huge stores that need a lot of night uh, logistics. Mm. So there's a lot of little things we work on. But at the moment, I must give the government credit for being super supportive, actually. Both the central government and the states. They're really helping us to get forward. I think there's a, a mindset of doing stuff right. Thank so we are very optimistic that it will work well for us. Now we have a year and a half left for the store opening, so a lot of things can happen. But as of today, it's very positive. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, Tarun, you know, what I noticed in, in the glorious work you presented last evening is how defined the fit was. Um, and this seems, to my mind, to tie in very perfectly uh, with uh, the Swedish aesthetic, which is also very structured, very correct, and very fitting. So I was wondering, you know, if I could move on from the move the discussion a little more towards the creative part, you know, which is what you would understand. And if you would uh, help us explain what you think are the aesthetic parallels between Sweden and India, and how by recognizing those, you could actually help mine businesses. God, that's a tough question. Um, I think that one of the things that Scandinavian style has projected is a very cohesive, um, a very cohesive statement built and designed out of the life they live. Mm -hmm. and, and there's no better integrity to design process. In fact, that's one of the reasons I stopped showing in Milan because we didn't know what to do in winter. You know, there was no connect because we'd be sitting in 45 degrees centigrade and what we were supposed to design and there was also you know, limitations with fabrics that we could mm. bring in and stuff because we are essentially a hot tropical country mm. and a few cities get cold for two months, literally, and even that's shrinking. So I think what I see with, you know, out of Sweden is very cohesive. I think what, we're, what I'm seeing, what I, what I kind of briefly alluded to, is that I feel that we're becoming schizophrenic in India because mm. we're very quick to, you know, to suck in this whole Western influence it's more practical, you know, lifestyles are changing. Uh, you've got a lot of brands coming in, or oh, whether they're Indian brands or selling export reject. And then suddenly the same people want to be completely over the top Indian. Mm. Now, I wouldn't see that happening in Sweden at all, you mm. know. Mm. Uh, I mean, there's a cohesiveness between, say, the way a man and woman looks at the day and what they would look like at a wedding or a black tie. Mm. But in India, there is no, no. connect. Right. And I find that socially disturbing <laughs> for a society because I think that at some level, it's such a projection, no matter where you get the projection from, and it's a little irrational, and it's getting more and more, you know, disconnected, and yeah. you know, you're kind of taking things from Bollywood or this or that, I'm, I'm not really clear, and if you're not connected to yourself, well, how does design or how you express yourself work mm. in an authentic way? Mm. So to me, that's the big difference. We're a society that's in such a transition so fast. Mm. I mean, those photos that were behind the models were probably two generations back. I mean, you know, it's mm. recent photography. Mm. So you've got that happening on the street. You've got this, you've got the mini skirt and the disco. It's all happening so fast. Mm. And people who want to be a access, mm. you know, mm. all of it. And I think that when the dust settles, both design and lifestyle, must speak to something. There'll be many different niches and there'll be many mm. different, you know, spheres for different people, but you've got to belong somewhere sometime. You know? Right, I mean, right. And you have to have that cohesive linearity. Uh, yeah, and I mean, I think that that's what mature society is all about. And mm. we're in such a spin at the moment, I don't know where the dust is going to settle. Well, also, but you know, when people say, oh, that's so interesting, when people come from abroad and they say, oh, you know, you have so much variegation, and I think, yes, and most of it is ugly. Heinous, ugly is kind. You know, but so. you just look at it, whether it's architecturally, there is no cohesiveness, all of that. I, you know, and I think that that's a great thing that one can learn from a country like Sweden, yeah. where you can draw that cohesiveness. We, and, I just <laughs> said that this morning, we went for a walk, 
in the big garden. We were driving around. And I said, you know, even the things were built over 300 years. Yeah. There's a cohesiveness. There's yeah. a beautiful color sense. It's the way buildings are painted. I mean, if you go 300 feet in, in Delhi or Bombay, where <laughs> new buildings are built, you're assaulted. It's like being in some, you know, amusement park. I mean, it's just so much... Punjabi Baroque, as they called it, you know. <laughs> and, uh, a bit of this, a bit of that. <laughs> yeah. uh, Anna, one of the things I want to ask you is, um, in, in keeping with the line of work that you do, is that, you know, I'm obviously a huge champion of Sweden. I've been coming here for many years. I really love your country. I, um, it's unfortunate that not more Indians uh, would choose to travel and look at the countryside, look and take in the design, the fashion. What do you believe you can do to initiate dialogue in both in, in, in the tourist sphere of bringing more people in uh, and for work um, and raising the profile uh, in the media of Sweden and India? Uh, well, you know, <coughs> when, you come, when it comes down, you know, everything is a brand. Right. So Sweden is a brand, of India course. is a brand. Of course. Um, and uh, we, we are, I, I work for the Swedish government and, you know, something that makes it worth working for the government, you know, you get less paid and all that. Mm. But something that is cool with that mm. is that we are building the Swedish brand and there's a lot of values in that, such as sustainability, social responsibility, uh, equal rights, etc., that are really cool to work with. Mm. And when you look at Swedish companies, they are also the bearers of those brands typically. And that goes both for industrial and it goes for consumer. Mm. And if you ask Swedish companies, we ask them every year actually, and they said it's becoming more and more important for them to mm. actually be a Swedish company. Mm. Uh, but then, you know, then actually making Swedish Sweden, which is a very small country in a huge country like India, mm. it, it is a challenge. Mm. I think something is, you know, to have all the kind of ambassadors mm. for for Sweden and India and the other way around. Uh, one is, of course, the, uh, the 160,000 people working for Swedish companies in mm. India. The other ones are the, the uh, 800 students mm. coming to, from India to Sweden to, to study every year. Um, I think if you, you look at Sweden and India right now, I think probably Volvo is mm. the most famous brand. And that has gone beyond being a Volvo bus. It's actually about going in a AC comfortable bus. Mm. Actually, the, the man who built that brand was here in the morning, Akash Passi. Right. I, I think that will change next year when what Patrick calls the, the, the big box retail, when we'll have those blue and yellow IKEA boxes started to be set across the country. Mm. I think that will have a real band, a brand building mm. for Sweden. Mm. And I think that, that actually what, what corporate is doing and what's happening in the cultural space uh, and, and consumer space is at much larger impact than what <coughs> we can kind of do from our small mm. governmental resources. So I think it's more that we try to hold it, hold it together from a Swedish side, and of course also connected with, with India because it's a partnership. Yeah, but also what comes to mind is the Swiss model of how they actually uh, contracted out Bollywood films where they supported them to get them to come to Switzerland and shoot over there. And that's why Switzerland, you know, became one of the most popular destinations for travel. And so the awareness, you know, that there's an Indian restaurant on, uh, at the top of Jungfrau <laughs> called Bollywood. So, you know, it, those are the kinds of things that I think, you know, are going to be things that Sweden's going to have to open up and say, look, how do we, this is a huge audience, how, uh, how are we going to engage with them? Rajiv, um, I wanted to actually jump from the wine question with you because, you know, we both Love Goa. I am the founder of, uh, of the largest festival, arts festival there called Sensorium. Um, and I've seen very quickly of how uh, audiences are engaged because of art, you know, in, in a larger space when you look at Bilbao and how, you know, it brought in $550 uh, million dollars in, in Spain within three years and changed a failing city and the face of a failing city. So you host um, Sula Fest, which is a music fest, which is an arts fest in Nasik in and around where your vineyards are held. So I'm wondering if there are ways that, you know, a festival and the model of the festival can be used to engage with businesses and to be uh, able to get, you know, larger audiences from abroad uh, to where you are. Well, very much so, engage with audiences. Mm. Um, you know, one of the problems that we faced in the beginning was that wine is not a part of any tradition in India. So it's a little bit sort of uh, mysterious, you know, people don't know which wine to choose, this and they're a little, you know, they're, they're not that comfortable with it. You know, it's a little bit like out there. And we wanted to make people feel that it's, you know, it's, it's a very uh, cool part of, you know, everyday life wine. Mm. So how do we do it? We are, you know, just a three hour drive from, uh, from 20 million 
uh, people mm -hmm. uh, or more. In fact, if you take Pune into, into consideration, in a beautiful space. And we said, right, let's do a really nice music festival at the vineyard and just make it a, a lovely day out, mm. a lovely weekend out now mm. it's become. And um, just show people that you, you're, you're sitting on the, on the grass, you're, you're, you're sipping your wine and watching some great music. That association is going to last forever. Mm. So we started nine years ago with Sula Fest. We had 200 people, all my friends, you know, coming for like an impromptu, impromptu rave party. That is how we started. This year we had 15,000 people. So the numbers are just like going wow. up 25, 30% a year. Yeah. Um, and everyone, everyone had a great time, but we've really uh, made it uh, a little bit more open. So one of the things that we decided to do was not only serve wine. Mm. So it's a gourmet food festival. We invite, you know, restaurants like Olive, etc., to come there and have their, uh, their, their stalls. Pop -ups, right. And we also allow mm -hmm. spirits companies and beer companies to partner with us and have their stalls. So it's okay. You don't have to only drink wine. But you realize that wine is part because, you know, we are less than 1% sure. of all alcoholic beverages consumed. At sure. the end of the day, people are drinking way, way, way more whiskey. So you can come as a group, somebody likes whiskey, fine, let them drink, but everybody's going to try your wine there, etc. And we found it's a, it's a really great connect. Now, I don't know about other brands and mm -hmm. how it would work for them. Mm -hmm. We had a, you know, a, a, we have this space, we have this beautiful 40 acre property mm -hmm. where we decided to do it, but we took a chance. And the one thing I do know is that Indians are going to go to more and more festivals. Yeah. Uh, it's just skyrocketing. You know, every day there's a new festival being announced because the, the chances, the, the, the choices of entertainment within the cities are so limited. And so people are looking to get out of there on the weekend, go someplace beautiful and, and let their hair down. Wonderful. Thank you. I have five minutes to take questions, sir. Yeah, I want to ask, uh, I want to ask uh, Patrick, uh, Ikea. Uh, when you have so many products uh, you want to bring into India and 10,000 or maybe a few thousand products, you're sourcing them from Ukraine and from China and Sweden and anywhere. How do you handle the duty, duty India? Well, we pay them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we have a, a large logistical setup around the world, so these products go to certain distribution centers normally and then from the distribution center you pull them to the country so we will pull them then from Europe and from China and Dubai into India those products that we cannot make in India mm. but the goal over time is to make much more in India the government has stipulated 30 percent over five years but we have higher hopes than that because we want to be affordable mm. so the goal is really to make as much as possible in India and not only for India but for the world so we will reverse the so if you make more in India then you can sell in India you can change uh, with others uh, without paying duty or no we have to pay input duties on all the products we bring in we have to pay uh, i think it's an average of 30 you can't or something have some interchange uh, no, like unfortunately not to have mass production you have some produce in india and some there uh, <laughs> why not and then you switch you get some benefits when you export, I think. Yeah, there's say, an export benefit, but we, but we, uh, we have external change. suppliers, so they get the export benefits. There's a lady at the back, sorry, question. Uh, my name is Ujwala Andeshon, and uh, it was very interesting to hear your speeches. But I have one question to Patrick uh, about IKEA. It was very interesting to hear that uh, you are adapting your um, stores in Mumbai according to their needs, and in Delhi according to their needs. Uh, so I was just thinking, uh, I have lived here for the past 40 years, and uh, used a lot of uh, furniture of IKEA. But practice for IKEA is that you take your car, you go to IKEA, and you bring the big box, mm. uh, and you have the parts of the furniture, and you come home with that, with that big box, and you have a manual. And uh, I'm lucky enough to be married to a Swede, so he will <laughs> start uh, within one and two hours, he will assemble the things quickly, and. Uh, some cupboard is there or whatever Quick furniture question, is there. And every time he has done it, I'm looking at it. Oh, wow, so fast you have just assembled it. I am with the Indian origin. I am not handy at all. <laughs> okay, ma'am, your question. I, I want to get to the question. Yeah, what question is your question? question is that how IKEA have they thought about it, that Indians are not that handy 
to assembly, the, they you, want somebody to do it. They oh, just you they will say hello. That's a great question. Sorry, Patrick. Are you go suggesting on. to send your husband <laughs> to India? <or>? <laughs> Pardon me? <laughs> Are you suggesting to send your husband to India? Uh, no. Uh, uh, it's uh, uh, 1.3 billion people, so I don't think he will it be. It was able very to fast. You said. Otherwise, <laughs> you said he was very fast. <laughs> uh, no, obviously we have noticed in our research that uh, Indians, many Indians, are not so used to doing handwork. Hmm. However, the basic rule for IKEA. No, of course, he's very handy. Tarun is very handy. He's going to buy so many IKEA furniture. <laughs> uh, the basic rule will apply also in India is that if you are a price conscious person, you should be able to go to the store, pick your product, drive it home yourself, and assemble it. That's the basic of the concept. But in all countries, we have services. And of course, in India, there will be more services. Mm. So, for example, the areas where we will plan to have home deliveries from are much, much, much bigger in India because we know people have small cars or maybe no car. Mm. We're locating the stores on top of metro stations. So we're very near the metro, so it's easy to go in and out of the store. We're looking at assembling a lot more product than we do in uh, other countries. So we are preparing for a different service need. We don't have more, not various service maybe, but much more of those services that we have. Yes. So yes, we are prepared. But we, uh, we also hope somehow over time that Indians will find that it's not that difficult to assemble an IKEA table as it is to build a table. That many <laughs> things, when you ask someone, oh, you're going to put together your table. And they just look yes. at you, they, they see in front of you, you're going to hammer, you're going to chisel, you're going to do, you know. No, it's six screws, you know, just do like that. Okay, but still, we believe in a much higher percentage. Thank you so much. There's a question here from the second row. <coughs> so yes, I have a question to Rajiv. And uh, I've had the pleasure to live in Mumbai for a few years and uh, got very used to the Sula wine. So when am I going to have that in Sweden? <laughs> so I have cards of my importer in <laughs> yeah. my pocket and I'm going to give you one after, after this conference. So we do have a, an importer in Sweden. Uh, we just. In a, in a small way, we are not with System Bologit uh, yet, but we do hope to persuade them to put out an offer for Indian wine as well, because their, I think one of their missions is to, that they have to have a selection from across the world and not just concentrate. So we hope that they will be in the monopoly soon. But uh, you know, for, for instance, the, our importer supplied the wines for the, uh, the gala dinner uh, last night. They're called Speedy Wines, and so yes, they are now available. And that's where I'm headed to. I'm going to wrap up this panel. My guests are going to be around uh, in case you want to have a chat with them right outside. But thank you so much for spending a sunny afternoon with us in a closed room with no light except for the genius light of my panelists. Please give it up for each one of them.